Welcome to the Feisty Women's Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gross, Ironman champion, PhD in women's history, and founder and CEO of Feisty Media. I started this show because I wanted to cut through the BS of diet culture and fitness culture and actually learn from high achieving women at the top of their game who have figured out how to feel and perform their best at every stage of life. So I chat with experts, elite athletes, and leaders who have learned to succeed despite the massive gender data gap in exercise and medical science and product development. Every episode is filled with information, advice, and anecdotes that will help you fulfill your potential as an athlete, mom, leader, or business owner. And listen up. If you don't subscribe to our women's performance newsletter, you are definitely missing out. It's totally free. So head over to womensperformance.com and subscribe now. That's womensperformance.com. This podcast is a production of Feisty Media. No one understands the business case for women's sports better than my guest today, Caroline Fitzgerald. Over the last year or so, as women's sports viewership numbers have been hitting record highs, we've heard a lot of stats thrown around, like women's sports is set to become a billion dollar industry in 2024, and that the percentage of sports media dedicated to women is up from 4% to 15%. But what does that really mean? How are these numbers calculated? And is a billion dollars or 15% good? What are the business advantages of investing in women's sports and what can we all do to help? That is what I asked Caroline to unpack for us today and I learned a ton. So before we dive into the interview, let me tell you a bit about Caroline and the incredible work she is doing. This is directly from the Goal Sports website. Caroline Fitzgerald is the CEO and founder of Goals. Before jumping in full-time in August of 2021, Caroline worked for over a decade as a marketing and sales professional across a variety of industries. Most recently, Caroline was the Senior Vice President of Partnerships at P3R and the Dick's Sporting Goods Pittsburgh Marathon. In her role at P3R, Caroline was responsible for selling and activating partnerships with brands that included Dick's Sporting Goods, FedEx, Brooks Running, Duncan, PNC Bank, Barefoot, Panera, Noon Hydration, Bank of America, and many more. Caroline graduated from the Schreier Honors College at Penn State University with dual degrees in marketing and women slash gender studies and holds an MS in global sport from the Tisch Institute for Global Sport at NYU. Goals is a marketing and sponsorship consultancy that is fully dedicated to growing women's sports. We love that. A few years back, when Caroline learned that women's sports receive less than 1% of global sponsorship dollars, she knew she had to do something. Moreover, she knew about the research that shows that sponsors of women's sports teams actually see better returns on their investments than sponsors of men's sports teams. So... Caroline set out to show brands, networks, and investors that it's good business to invest in women's sports. Caroline also hosts the Business Case for Women's Sports podcast, which is presented by Ally. If you are at all curious about how the business side of the women's sports industry works, why it's growing so rapidly right now, and how we can help keep that momentum going, this episode is for you. Caroline, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Sarah, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. I cannot wait to dig in. I'm such a big fan of everything that you do with Feisty Media. So again, it's just such an honor to be here. Yeah, I'm already absorbing your passion and your energy, but where does that like sort of passion for the growth of the women's sports industry come from for you? That's such a great question. It's, I want to say it's been brewing my whole life, if you will. So Mm -hmm. I guess a bit more about me and my background. I come from a really big family. I'm one of eight kids. 
born and raised Whoa. in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Eight kids, okay. eight girls mm-hmm. and two boys. So mm-hmm. a lot of girl power in my house and growing up, I feel like the one of the, or one of the ways that our parents kept us organized was by having us play sports. So it was like, go outside and play four on four or whatever. So we all grew up. Like, you have like a whole team, right? With your siblings. <laughs> correct. You can essentially almost field a whole baseball team, almost yeah. play a full five on five basketball. Basketball. Um, yeah. So it's just, that's, we all played sports growing up. That was a core part of who we were as people and who we were as a family. So I started playing sports from a very young age. My first sport that I played was baseball. And so um, the the birth order of my family is it goes three girls, a boy, three girls, a boy. So I was very close. I'm the third oldest with the boy who was born right after me, Tanner, my brother, Tanner. And so Tanner and I always grew up playing baseball together, especially with my dad. And when it came time for uh, my parents to sign us up for Little League, there was no girls baseball team. There wasn't even, I don't think, a softball team at the time. So my parents just said, you and Tanner are going to play on the same team. You're going to play on the boys team and didn't even really give it a second thought. I was a baseball player. I was going to play on the baseball team that was available in our neighborhood. So I'm going to tell a little story. I remember showing up for our first game and I was so excited to play. We're so little. So it's not T-ball level. It's parent pitch though. So the parents were pitching. Parent pitch. I love that. (laughs) Parent pitch baseball. We're so little showing up and we show up. And I remember almost immediately the team that we were playing started taunting our team and making fun of us because we had a girl on our team because I was on the team and they were doing little kid teasy things like, Oh, we're going to crush them. Girls can't play baseball. We're going to win things like that. And I remember just being so caught off guard because I had never experienced anything like that because I, all I knew was being good at baseball and playing baseball in my yard with girls and boys. And I was just there to play. And I had never considered that I might not belong there because I was a girl or because of my gender. So I got really mad. I was like, what is this? This is ridiculous. So we took the field and I was playing the position of pitcher's helper. Again, this is parent pitch. So I'm standing next to the pitcher's mound to field any balls that would be hit in the direction of the parent pitcher that couldn't make the plays in the field. That would be ridiculous. Um, And the first three boys on the other team all hit ground balls right to me, and I got them all out, one, two, three. And I remember walking off the field that day with just this sense of passion and confidence and purpose and this feeling of like, never again, is anyone going to tell me that I don't belong somewhere, especially in sports, because I'm a girl, because I belong to be here. And so that was really a defining moment in my life. So when you ask the question, where does Mm -hmm. this fire, where does this passion come from? I think that's maybe the start of it. (laughs) It comes from my family being raised as an athlete, regardless of my gender. Um, And then that experience really kicked things off of being like, nope, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm a girl and I belong in sports. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I have, I relate to so many aspects of that story. You know, I was also on a t-ball team and the only girl. And in fact, that's the reason I left and joined a soccer team because they had, we had like girls soccer teams. I just felt weird about being the only girl, you know, but I definitely relate to this feeling of being like, just being good at sport as a kid, right. Playing with boys and girls and whomever else wanted to play, not like understanding that I was like relatively good at it and then observing the world (laughs) and seeing that like my pathway to playing pro sports or anything else like that was more limited because of my gender, like as I grew up. And I thought, I just thought that was so terrible, (laughs) you know, like that was just like this mind-blowingly bad experience for me. So I think that's where it comes from for me too. So that's really interesting that that's sort of similar for you. Um, I'm curious about just like, I'm going to flip that like, because we know that pre-puberty, boys and girls like physiologically do not have the same differences that we have post puberty. Right. So it's like crazy to me that we separate boys and girls in play, but like, were there any, if, when you joined that boys team, were there any, was there any parental level or adult level pushback or was it just the kids that kind of, um, teased you? You know, it was just the kids. I remember the coach of the other team who, 
ended up being really good friends with these boys and their parents over the years. We all ended up going to the same schools. Um, he kind of quieted those boys pretty quickly. <laughs> he was like, don't you dare. She's probably better than all of you. And just really hushed them up. So it really was, I think it was just kind of boys and kids, you know, seeing what they saw in the sand lot where people in the, the main insult of that movie being, you play ball like a girl, you know, it's just kind of what you saw in movies. So it was squashed pretty quickly. And again, it was just the kids and it didn't go on beyond that. I was really lucky in that regard. I know not everybody has had the same experience, but ultimately it was just a really welcoming community. And I ended up playing as the only girl in the league until about 13. Uh, until then, it was uh, some big, some big physical differences between boys and girls at that age. And then I went yeah. to play softball and started pursuing some other sports. Right. And so did you continue to play sports through high school and university? I did. So basketball ended up becoming my my core sport. I still play basketball to this day. I had a game last night, so I'm a little sore. Ooh, nice. <laughs> um, but I played basketball at a very high level in high school and then in college. Ended up playing Division One club basketball at Penn State, where I went to school. So that's the equivalent in the States of like Division Three or Division Two level. Um, and that was just like such a wonderful experience. I had the choice of going to play division two or division three at a smaller school or going to Penn state and playing club. And I ultimately wanted that larger university, well-rounded experience with the chance to keep playing basketball. So it was a great option. And again, played through college and still play now. And after college, I ended up coaching for many years as well. So uh, coach at the high school level as both an assistant coach and then as a head coach of a program here in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And part of, you know, part of my personal passion for women and girls in sport comes from this idea that when we play sport as kids, well, we know it's true. When we play sport as kids, we're more, tend to be more confident. Um, have, has that been your experience too? Especially as, I mean, we're going to talk about goal sports next, but like as you've sort of gone out on your own and started goal sports, has the fact that you played sport as a young person, do you think that that's affected your confidence and ability to do that? 100 percent i feel so strongly about this both as a person as an athlete and as a coach um like i said when i coach i just think we learn so many incredible lessons when we play sports for me you know i think the biggest thing that i've carried through with me might not necessarily be confidence um sometimes sports can be a double double-edged sword in that regard where it can give you great confidence, but it also can knock your confidence down. I experienced both of those things playing sports. And a lot of that, I think, depends on the coaches that you have and the people that are around you while you're playing sport. For the most part, though, sport has been a really positive experience for me. And I think back to what I was saying, the thing that I've carried the most with me is kind of that athlete discipline and toughness mentality, um, like that ability to push through even when things are tough, like knowing that you just have to keep showing up and pushing through and getting there. I think that's a big thing. And then I also think, and I think this is really applicable to the women's sports community, is that you learn in sports that, especially the sports I played like basketball, is that you're stronger when you're working with your team. So this might sound a little bit cliche, but we go farther <laughs> together. But yeah. I really do believe that when you have a whole team that's operating with the same goals and purpose and on the same page you do you just accomplish more and you get farther um so that's something i've also always just carried through with carried through with me excuse me um and now being in the women's sports space it's so clear that this this industry like everything we're doing here is just going to keep growing if we keep working together and build it mm -hmm. as a place that's collaborative and community based so I think those are the two key things, that discipline, that toughness, um, then also that that teamwork and partnership mentality. Yeah. And I think now I'm going off script again, but like I th I think that as we build out sort of we're like at the beginning of building 
a women's sports industry, I think. I mean, there's been a lot of people coming before, but we're starting to see rapid growth, you know, and I love just being part of this moment and this time. But I think that we have this opportunity to build it in a super collaborative way. And I think that's, you know, on average, more how women would like to build things too. So um, I love it. But okay, on your website, it says women's sports receive less than 1% of sponsorship dollars. Our goal is to change that. So when did you start goal sports and like, how exactly do you, do you take that giant, I call it like a big feisty goal. Like how do you take that big feisty goal and make it a reality? It certainly is a big feisty goal because that <laughs> 1% is abysmal and it's actually embarrassing <laughs> at, to our industry and just on the whole with how we value women in sport. But um, I'll take it back to why I started goals. So a little bit about my professional background. So I always knew in my life that I did want to ultimately do something at the intersection of sports and business and feminism. I studied marketing and women's studies in college. Like I said, I've been an athlete my whole life. I knew someday, like that's the space I wanted to be in, but it's it wasn't super clear what that could be when I was in college. So put myself on a path to be a marketer, learn how to create marketing plans, worked in marketing for the first couple um, jobs I held in my career, and then ultimately found myself as the head of sponsorships at the Dick's Sporting Goods Pittsburgh Marathon in a sponsorship sales role, which... I was hesitant about it first because I didn't really see myself as a salesperson. I saw myself as a marketer, uh, but I realized really quickly that sponsorship sales is just building good marketing plans for the brands that you mm. need to sponsor whatever you're selling. So I found a lot of success doing that. Um, and I also, in that job, found myself working in sports for the first time and absolutely loved it. I got to see firsthand working for the marathon the impact that sport can have on a large scale um, community. So like how the marathon and our running events impacted the whole city of Pittsburgh. It was just so incredible. So I absolutely love that and found myself at home working in that industry, working for that organization. While I was working there, the global pandemic um, starts surging. I was able to work full time while um, the pandemic was going on, but I was privileged to work from home and doing a little bit of soul searching, if I'm being honest around, you know, what I would want to do next if I, if we ever made it out of this global pandemic. And I kind of came back to that original thesis statement, if you will, around feminism, sports, and business. And at the time, you know, we're all kind of stuck at home. There were more women's sports available to watch than ever because of streaming and the format of shortened seasons and bubbles. And I found myself naturally being pulled to these women's sports leagues um, and watching these competitions. But what I was pulled to wasn't necessarily the games. Like certainly it's incredible to watch the best athletes in the world compete, but I was really struck by how dynamic women athletes are in everything that they do, not only on the field of play, but off the field from an activism perspective fighting for equity, being moms that compete at this high level. Like women athletes are absolutely remarkable. I know I don't need to tell you this, but it's just, I was just absolutely blown away. And I was like, why is there not more attention being given to this? The sports industry, so why, why do we not have more money? Why is there not more coverage and viewership? So I started you know, digging in a little bit more. And I learned that stat that women's sports only received 1% of the sponsorship dollars and women's sports at the time were only receiving 4% of media coverage. And the list goes on and on of those inequities. And so I was going for a lot of walks and runs at the time. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts and I really wanted to listen to a podcast about specifically the intersection of sports business um, and women athlete activism. And I couldn't find one. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a podcast. <laughs> There's not a women's sports business podcast that exists. Love it. I'm going to try this. I'm just going to see what happens. Um, so as a marketer, fired up um, some social media accounts, created the brand goals, started putting out this content around the business side of women's sports. And that's really how Goals was born as a side project. Did it as a side project for about a full year um, until I realized that 
kind of the number one thing that we were putting out across our channels and that I was speaking about with my guests so often on the podcast is that we need more money. We need more resources in women's sports in order to grow it. And I had a sponsorship sales skill set. And that's a big way that we make our money in the sports industry is through sponsorship sales. So ultimately put together a business model where we could help under-resourced pro women's sports teams, leagues, and organizations with their sponsorship efforts. So when you coming back to your original question, the big goal of women's sports receive 1% immediate or 1% of sponsorship dollars. And our goal is to change that. We attack it from two fronts. One through the content that we put out through the podcast and through our, our digital footprint, um, really demonstrating the value proposition of women's sports, how it's great business to invest in women's sports from a financial perspective, the return on investment that you see when you invest in women's sports and women athletes actually is better than when you invest in men's sports. There's all this data now to back that up, right? But it's yeah. also the right thing to do. It's like this perfect win-win when you invest in women's sports, what is right lives alongside what is profitable. So you're not only contributing to this greater movement for gender equity, but you're also going to make money while you're doing it. So it's like a classic win-win. So we put out this content and then we also got and do the actual work and make these sales, pursue um, these opportunities on behalf of, of women's sports properties to work with more brands and bring more money into their organization. So that's how we attack that big feisty goal. Big feisty goal. Amazing. Okay. Let's talk about, you said there's data to show that the brands will get a better ROI if they invest in women's sports or sponsor women's sports. Can you unpack that a little bit? Like, what does that look like? How are they getting a better ROI? Yeah, there's a couple ways. Um, so kind of the secret sauce of women's sports is how, um, both women athletes and, um, how women athletes and women's sports organizations market themselves and then how women's sports fans like to consume content. So okay. women sports for a long time has not been available through traditional media platforms, like on TV. We'll, we'll put it that simply. Women's sports have not been on TV for a long time. So the way that women's sports fans have been able to consume women's sports media is mostly through digital channels, one of those being social media. So in that, we've kind of created this ecosystem where women's sports and women athletes are incredible digital marketers. And we're able to like really show up in an authentic way in this digital and social space where our fans have been trained to consume our content. So it's created this situation where we're able to serve this really, really incredible content to fans that are hungry for it and are waiting right there to take it. So for that reason, it's this interesting value proposition proposition around how incredible the customers of women's sports are. Customers of women's sports are much more likely to be loyal to a brand and become a mm -hmm. customer a brand that sponsors women's sports than the equivalent of men's sports. So when you're thinking about if a brand is thinking about, should I sponsor men's sports or should I sponsor women's sports? They, I feel like they can think about it in two ways. If you want to hit like the most amount of eyeballs, like say you just, it's just like quantity play. Sure. For a long time, men's sports have had larger audiences because they've been around longer, have more media exposure and et cetera, et cetera. But if you want to hit customers that are most likely to actually, or fans that are most likely to become your customers, you should be sponsoring women's sports. So that's kind of the summary of it. There's been, again, as I said, a lot of research that's been done around this. Um, there's been some incredible research done, um, a report done by the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation in um, Australia, put out a report around the Women's World Cup in 2023. And they found that for every $1 that a brand invests into women's sports um, from a sponsorship perspective, they see a seven time return or seven. Yeah. Seven times return on that dollar spent. So they Whoa. make $7 for every one spent. So again, that's just one example. There's all these other reports that have come out, especially in the last couple of years. I mean, a seven X return is huge. It's you. I mean, who wouldn't want to spend $1 to get $7? Right. So yeah, it's not only do we like feel it in women's sports, but we have the data now to prove that this is an incredible value for brands to get involved. Interesting. So are there more, do you know, are there more women who watch women's sports? 
Do you know what I mean? Like, is the audience, does the audience skew more female for women's sports? You know, it depends on the sport. On the whole, actually, the data that I saw most recently is that it actually skews more ma- more male than female. Interesting. Yeah, that's why I asked. I didn't want to assume that, right? Yeah. Right, because there is this perception out there that the only fans of women's sports can be women and young girls. A lot of the marketing mm-hmm. for a long time has been around inspiring the next generation and how can we do things to attract young girls to watch women's sports but that's not actually true women's sports are for everybody (laughs) the the variety of type of fan that we have in women's sports is pretty remarkable and yeah again the last report that I saw is that it actually skews a bit more male which isn't totally surprising because for a long time sports content in general has been created for men by men. So as women's sports become more prominent, we already have this huge base of sports fans that are are male identifying that are just poised to consume more sports content. And now it happens to be sports content. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So I want to talk about um, the report by Deloitte about how um, women's sports next year is set to become a billion dollar industry. We saw that headline everywhere right and to me it just feels like throwing a big number <laughs> into the media with like without any understanding of what that is and what that means so like what does that mean and like how do we compute that kind of revenue in the sports industry like how do we say oh this industry is worth a billion dollars or you know five billion dollars yeah that's a great question so i'll talk a little bit about the report to start so Deloitte's team, um, their global sports insight team, did this massive research project to understand um, how many or what amount of global revenues that women's sports would generate in 2024. So um, they dug in to understand like how much money women's sports are making, essentially. Um, So they've been tracking this, I think, for a couple years now. Since 2020, they put out this prediction that said that in the next couple of years, we expect that women's sports will crack that $1 billion revenue mark. Um, So what they learned after doing this projection, the study was led by a woman named Jennifer Haskell, who really like dug in, rolled up her sleeves and found (laughs) all the data to cobble together this projection that um, global revenues for women's sports in 2024 would be $1.28 billion. And that's significant because it's the first time in history that women's sports will surpass that $1 billion revenue mark. Um, I think it is important to keep this in perspective, though, about how actually big the sports industry revenues are. Right. Well, that's, yeah. (laughs) Good, yeah. Yeah, I know for men's sports, it's maybe somewhere around $500 billion. So yes, this is a significant milestone for women's sports, but th- that just keeping in perspective of how, how big business sports actually are. Um, so that's really high level what the report is. How Jennifer came to that number was really looking at how... Uh, professional women's sports properties across the globe make their money. So the breakdown, Mm. commercial revenue, um, media revenue, and then match day revenue. So things like sponsorship sales, partnership sales, merchandise sales, that makes up commercial media and broadcast or those media rights that leagues and um, properties sell to big media companies to be able to show their, their games and then match day ticket sales, things like that. So Putting that to get putting that all together, the number one way that women's sports makes its money right now is through commercial revenue, um, mm-hmm. which I think is really interesting because the way that men's sports makes the majority of their revenue is through media and broadcast. So what I think the thing that I like the most about this projection is it shows the amount of opportunity that's here. So obviously we're really poised and we have the commercial revenue, the match day revenue, like we have solid um, business streams like we've seen success in those areas but there's just so much runway ahead there's so much opportunity around the media and broadcast rights um so the billion dollars certainly exciting but i'm really excited to see how much opportunity there is if we can equal out the gender gap that exists in sports media coverage Right. Well, and yeah, I mean, I want to talk about media next. And I'm glad that you brought that up about like the men's. I I 
quick Googled it this morning, you know, like what is the global sports industry worth? And it's like, it came out, I don't even know if the answer was absolutely correct. The first thing I saw on Google, but 500 billion plus was the number, you know? And so in perspective, <laughs> you know, we're still talking about that one to 2% that, you know, that we see that you put on your website, right? Um, so, yeah. and it's interesting to me that the piece, like what you're pulling out there is like that the mainstream media piece is the piece that's maybe lagging behind a little bit in terms of the revenue. So you were talking about commercial revenue, um, sponsorships, I think, like, and, and yet the mainstream media, like we saw in that, another report, another, the other big report from 2023 was that Wasserman report um, that noted the change from the 4% that women's media coverage got out of, you know, all of, all of sports media to 15%. The main reason I think that we saw that increase from 4% of sports coverage being women's sports to 15% was because they took into account social media, right? It's not because the mainstream media started covering more women's sports. It's because they looked more broadly at how people are watching sports and said, oh, wait a second, more people are watching sports on social media and it's 15%. So <laughs> can you unpack that um, a little bit for us? Yeah, Sarah, you're absolutely right. So I mentioned this at the top, but for a long time, women's sports were believed to receive just 4% of media coverage. And there was a study that was done by Professor, Professor Cheryl Cookie, um, I believe she's the head of media studies. I'm probably messing up her exact title at Purdue, but she's done a long standing study for a really long time to understand the media coverage split between men's and women's sports. And at the time that that study was conducted, I don't even think social media really existed or it certainly wasn't existing at the scale that it does today. So that study was based mostly off of traditional and mainstream media. So mm -hmm. women's sports were projected or measured to only receive 4% of mainstream media coverage. This new report from Wasserman is now taking into account the entire landscape of media coverage in women's sports and measuring how we've grown um, over the years when it comes to coverage in every aspect, of course, covering that mainstream media piece um, like done in the first report, but also now taking into account new media streams like streaming, social media, digital media, um, and just really, again, taking that whole 360 approach to understanding the media landscape now that we have more media streams available. And what they found is that as far as the total high, the total share of coverage that women's sports receive now is 15%, which is up from that 4%. However, when you look, when you peel back the layers and you look at it, just like you said, Sarah, that growth has been pretty much exclusively driven by social and emerging media. So mm -hmm. streaming and social media specifically, um, traditional linear media still lingers around four to 5%. So there really hasn't been any growth <laughs> in the traditional and linear media space um, over the last couple decades, which is pretty shocking. I was pretty shocked when I dug into this report and saw that. But mm -hmm. on the flip side of that, I was also, you know, really inspired and kind of reinvigorated in the work that we do at Golds with putting out this digital, this different type of content. Um, for women's sports across the podcast, across social, this growth is really being driven driven by digital and social media. Um, and I think I think that's really interesting. And I think it leans into that value proposition of women's sports that we are such good digital marketers and we are right. showing up in the spaces now where fans more and more want to consume that content. There's all this research being done around how sports fans are shifting more and more into preferring streaming versus watching on traditional linear. And they prefer to consume content in smaller bite-sized pieces on apps like TikTok and Instagram versus more of this traditional long form content. So we're really positioned in an incredible way to keep growing mm -hmm. women's sports and growing our share of that pie. Um, I would like to see traditional media catch up. But I think the fact that we've been able to move that needle with digital 
social and emerging media alone is pretty remarkable. And again, I think it just speaks to the power of women's sports. Yeah, I just see nothing but opportunities, you know, um, in terms of like the fact that we're seeing growth, right? So people are recognizing the opportunities in women's sports, but also there's a huge amount to grow into, right? Um, okay. So I think, I just think I'm just so excited, you know? <laughs> Um, and I wanted to talk to you about this. I saw this on your website this morning and I related so much to it that like when I first started my business, so many people asked me if, if I was a nonprofit, right. Yeah. Um, and it's because like oftentimes women's sports has been treated that way a little bit, like something that you like donate the after money to or whatever. Um, and I always like women's sports is not a charity. Like this is a legitimate, like women's sports media, like we do, it's, a legitimate business, you know, and I even I'm kind of fueled by that. Sometimes I had someone come into my office one time and say, like, I will have an office in a co working space. And he was like, Sarah, I just I don't understand how you're doing it. Like, do you have grants? <laughs> like, no, I'm running a business. Like, what? <laughs> and then even after I explained it to him, he still like he did not want the answer. Like he did not want that, like we could make sponsorship dollars on podcasts and the kinds of things I was telling him, you know, um, is that like, is that what, has that been your experience at all? You know, I think it's been the experience of the entire women's sports industry <laughs> of sure. everybody that yeah. exists in this space for a long time. This space has been looked at as, yeah, kind of the little sister of the sports, like mm -hmm. the charitable cause. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Like the nonprofit arm of sport, which is um, honestly not that surprising. I, there hasn't been much proof until recently that women's sports can be a viable business because right. women's sports haven't received any inputs that would make them a viable business. So mm -hmm. For a long time, there's this, I don't even know the exact stat, but I believe the commissioner of the NBA a couple years ago talked about how the WNBA loses $11 million per year. Yeah, And that's the stat that we hear a lot of keyboard warriors reference over and over and over again to talk about how women's sports just lose money and never make money. But when you actually peel back the layers, there has been very little investment that have gone that has gone into growing women's sports and scaling women's sports like it is a business. So it's absolutely surprise. It's like, how do you expect a business to grow if you don't invest in marketing, if you don't invest in staff, if you don't invest in infrastructure? Like that's just business 101. You have to yeah. invest in some startup costs to get revenue on the back end. You just have to do that. And women's sports haven't received any inputs of resources. And what's really remarkable about women's sports, and there's this quote from Midge Purse, who's um, an all-star soccer player in the NWSL and for the U.S. Women's National Team, she says, despite being denied sunlight, water, and uh, <laughs> food, women's sports are growing and blossoming. I totally messed up her quote, but basically saying we haven't received any of the resources that we need yet. We're still growing and we're still flourishing and we're still able to prove these business results. So imagine what would happen if we were actually watered and fed and received sunlight. So I think again, coming back to your original question, this thought about how we're just a charity or we're just you know, a gender equity initiative. Uh, it, it's just an outdated way about thinking about women's sports and not, not actually considering the possibility here if it is treated like a business. Endurance sports should be accessible to everyone, right? That's why we are so excited to be partnering with Motive. Motive is one of the fastest growing training apps in the world today with thousands of amateur athletes signing up every month and a nearly perfect 4.9 star rating in the app store. You are not a template and your training plan should not be either. 
prepare for running races, triathlons, cycling events, duathlons, or swim runs, however your season schedule shapes up, and get training written by some of the best coaches in the world in each discipline who know what it takes to help amateur athletes reach their goal on race day. The app takes the training written by those experts and then creates the most optimal training plan for your schedule, abilities, and goals. Plus, the training is fully customized to your race schedule. How much you can train each week, your current abilities, and the goals you want to achieve in your race. You can use the app for free as long as you want or get all the upgraded features from the app for just $19.99 a month. But as a feisty listener, you can sign up at mymotive.com and use the code FEISTY for two months of full premium access. That's right, you get two months of premium for free. So you quite literally have nothing to lose. So head over to mymotive.com, M-Y-M-O-T-T-I-V.com and use the code FEISTY, F-E-I-S-T-Y. And on a personal note, I know the founder of Motive and he is driven to make triathlon and all endurance sports more accessible for the athletes who care about their performance, but who aren't quite ready for a full-time personal coach. If that sounds like you, definitely try the app for two months for free. You literally have nothing to lose. For decades, running shoes have been researched, tested, and designed for men. Brands have relied on the shrink it and pink it approach to sell male shoes to female customers. That's why we are so excited to be working with Hedda's. Hedda's designs athletic footwear for women that elevates performance, safety, and style. Hedda's unlocks the science behind women's biomechanics through dedicated research, creates better shoes for women that support their longevity and performance, and establishes new design standards to promote transparency in a male-biased industry. Hedda's have a lower ankle collar to reduce rubbing, a breathable mesh toe box to allow for ventilation and to allow for female toe shape, a special kind of plate in the midsole to keep tired legs going, a narrow heel cup to reduce heel slippage and take the pressure off our Achilles, and a rounded instep to create a snug fit. Hedda's has three shoe models designed for different sessions, the Alma Cruise for long runs, the Alma Tempo for training days, and the Alma Speed for pushing the pace. I've personally been running in the Alma Cruise and I love them. It's the shoe I always wanted and never knew I needed. The fit is perfect in every way. You can get your own pair of Hedda's at Hedda's.com and use the code FEISTY20 for 20% off. That's FEISTY20 at Hedda's.com and it will all be in the show notes. Yeah, where do you, as someone who kind of spends her day in the intersection between business and sports, like where do you see the biggest opportunities right now? They're in every single aspect. We are know, that's, they're endless. Women's sports are really still in inf- infancy mode. So yes, we are in many ways at the beginning of the life cycle of women's sports. Certainly there have been women and men and people that have worked on growing the women's sports industry for centuries and dec- like so much time has gone in. This is, this isn't something that is just happening all of a sudden. We're very much standing on the shoulders of giants that have been working to grow women's sports for a really, really long time. But now finally, there's a few things happening that are really shifting and making it possible for women's sports to, to have the growth that we're seeing happen right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so as far as are there more opportunities or what's what's the next thing that could happen in women's sports. Every single aspect has opportunity here from the media rights perspective, from sponsorships, mm-hmm. um, from partnerships with athletes, from um, types of leagues, from the way that we actually play sports. Women's sports is just kind of this wide open white space um, mm-hmm. that's just like ready to be populated with great ideas and great people and um, investment. So 
you know, I really do think the sky's the limit in every aspect. There's no aspect of women's sports that has been like, quote unquote, tapped out at this point. It's just yeah. all wide open for growth. And I feel like, you know, we've watched over the last year, like first it was the NCAA basketball, like that was just suddenly huge and everywhere, <laughs> like the women's tournament, you know, and then we had the women's world cup in, in soccer. It was like, whoa, <laughs> that's huge. And then we had the launch of the hockey league, right? The professional hockey league. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> and just, I, every time I shouldn't be, but it's because of like all the years of being told like no one was going to pay attention to women's sports. Da, da, da. Even I am surprised sometimes at how it goes from like something I never saw on TV, didn't pay much attention to, to like, boom, it's everywhere, you know, and there's this massive flourishing league and people are showing up and watching and sponsorship deals are being done and athletes are being sponsored. So um, it's wild to watch. It is wild to watch and it's exciting to watch. It's exciting to see the fruits of the labor of so many people that have worked on this for so long, starting mm -hmm. to come to fruition and starting yeah. to get, get the respect, get the coverage, get the investment that it deserves. We're certainly not, we haven't accomplished nearly enough yet though. There's still so much to do to truly achieve not only equity, but equality in women's sports, there's definitely bright spots where we do have parity, but for the most part, those massive gap, gender gaps still do exist. So we still need to keep yeah. working. Yeah, for sure. And I'd love to know, you know, in, in your business in particular, have you seen some big wins over the sort of three or four years that you've been, what have been your big moments or business wins? Yeah. You know, I think generally speaking, it's been interesting doing the, specifically the sponsorship sales work over the last two and a half years. This isn't necessarily like a huge win that, you know, you can put a trophy on the wall and point to it. But when we started right at the, the beginning of goals and doing this work, it was really, really tough to even get meetings with brands to have them entertain the option of sponsoring women's sports. And when we did get meetings, we had to start with really educating them on women's sports, the value of women's sports. And it was just really, really a lot of educational conversations. By the time we got done talking about kind of what women's sports are and right. kind of the basics of it, there was no time left to talk about how we could partner, how we could work together. So mm -hmm. it was more really an exploratory curiosity space when we could even get into those rooms and have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Over these two and a half years, though, it's become a lot easier. It's definitely not easy yet, but to have those conversations. It's something now that brands are really considering. Um we're not there yet. Again, we're still floating at that 1% of sponsorship dollars. Right. There is not nearly, nearly enough um, of the sponsorship, overall sponsorship dollar spend that's being shifted into women's sports. But brands are more interested and more curious than ever. And we're starting to see more brands right now. They're in this phase of creating dedicated women's sports sponsorship strategies. So they're right. really thinking hard about how they're going to show up and optimize spends in women's sports. So mm -hmm. that's not, again, that's not like a huge win where it's like, oh yeah, we accomplished this big thing. But I see every single conversation we have as like a little clack, a little um, crack in the sports industry's glass ceiling right. on sponsorship. So mm -hmm. I like to think that like the education piece, like showing up, sending emails, sending decks, sending information has really helped get us to this point now where people are, now looking to entertain this more. Um, so I think that's a huge win for the industry as a whole over these last two and a half years is that every there's more curiosity, there's more awareness, like you said a couple of minutes ago around women's sports. It seems to be everywhere now. It's popping up more and more. So those conversations are getting easier. Um, for our business in particular, you know, every time we've signed a sponsorship deal on behalf of a women's sports team, that's like a huge moment for us to celebrate. We did a lot of work at the beginning of goals with um, the PHF, which is the league that then was acquired in professional women's hockey and is now the PWHL. We mm -hmm. 
brought in at the time partnership deals with Athleta and Canadian Tire and Origin Pet Foods and Cleveland Clinic Canada. And we're just really proud of that work that we did to demonstrate that brands are interested in spending and marketing to women's hockey fans and have really hoped that that's contributed to the success of this PWHL and just even making that all possible. So those have been some big wins and things that we definitely celebrate. And then as far as our content goes, we were really, really excited in 2023 to bring Ally on as the title partner of our podcast, which was just such a special moment um, for me personally as the host and creator of this podcast um, to have a brand come in and invest and say, this is really valuable content and um, we want to invest and help you create more of this content because we think it's important for the women's sports industry and the sports industry as a whole. So that was definitely a big win that um, we celebrated here at Goals. I love that. You know, and and I think I want to pull out a thread that you talked about that I've heard before where how important it is for brands and organizations to actually have a separate budget line for their women's sports spend apart from the men's, because how do you know, like, like you said earlier, there's a seven times ROI on average for, you know, a women's sports, um, if you invest in women's sports. And so how do you know what, what you're getting back? If you lump it in with some, like some other budget, you know, <laughs> um, whether that's like the men's sports budget or something else, right? Like you, I let, I like that brands are starting to see it as a separate, Thing and like create a separate strategy for it because it does need a little bit and often in a lot of sports it needs a slightly separate strategy you know because there tends to be like female athletes tend to have more dedicated followers for example so you might take a different approach to that than you would to like a men's team or the, a brand ROI that you're trying to get um if with your logo on the side of a <laughs> hockey arena or something right so I think like I just like that if it's a separate you know, if it becomes a separate budget line for organizations and for partners, for sponsors, then, you know, we can start to see, oh, when they get their seven times ROI, they're going to go, okay, more spending here, right? So I, I'm, i yeah, I thank you so much for the work that you do because I think it's so, so important. Yeah, we, we think so too. And it's hard. It's challenging. It's, I wish the money was coming in a lot faster to women's sports, but I, I do feel really optimistic that this is going to continue to change and get easier and is easier for everybody that's selling um, sponsorships in the women's sports space. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So for the, you know, for the average listener here, you know, we have a, we have a lot of active women in our audience. Um, how can they, everyone wants to know how they can help. Like how can they help continue the momentum of getting women into the industry or in improving the women's sports industry? You know, it's through simple things. It's through showing up and following your favorite women athletes on social media. It's by following women's sports media platforms like Feisty Media and Goals on social. It's engaging with women's sports content. It's watching women's sports when it's on TV. It's buying women's sports merchandise. It's correcting the people in your life when they call men's sports like oh the basketball team and then the women's basketball team and it's like wait why are we making the women's the other why is it not the men's basketball team and the women's basketball team it's correcting someone when they make a joke that says no one watches women's sports and being ready with a stat like oh really because ninety two thousand people showed up in nebraska to fill a football stadium to watch a women's volleyball game or 2 billion people watch the women's world cup this year. So you can't actually say no one watches women's sports anymore. So it's just showing up and supporting how you can, whether it be, you know, watching, purchasing tickets, showing up at games, showing up to showing up and talking to the people in your life to tell them about women's sports. And um, it's just anything that you can do. If you want to invest on a bigger level, there's usually kind of crowdfunding campaigns that pop up some interesting ones that I've been big fans of recently are crowdfunding campaigns to fund the creation of women's sports bars around the world. That seems to be the way that a lot of these ventures are getting funded. So for people that are like, I want to actually invest in women's sports, there are a lot of women's sports businesses that honestly are having some trouble getting loans um, to get their to start their businesses or getting funding. So they're going to the community to get that funding. So things like that pop up all the time. But 
just show up in the way that feels good for you. Show up any way that you can, because every single like, share, watch, conversation, it all adds up and it all makes such a big difference. I love that. I'm seeing a parallel between, you know, we didn't, women only had 4% of sports media coverage. So we went to social media, started covering, we crowdsourced media, right? And voila, look, like people do want to watch. And then like from what you're saying there, I love that. It was like, we're having trouble getting funded for our sports bar or whatever other women's sports organization we want to start. Okay, we'll crowdsource it because people want it. So I think, I just think that's amazing. It shows the power of like that an individual like the difference an individual can make, whether that's helping fund or watching something online. One hundred percent. I've never heard it described like that. We crowdsourced media, <laughs> but that's, <laughs> right. that's literally what we have done here, and it's and it's working. And mm -hmm. the sports bra in Portland is the first dedicated women's sports bra in the world that exists because people showed up and gave donations to get that off the ground. Um, and Jenny who founded that it just made it happen with the funding that she was able to get from incredible people in the community. And now we're seeing it happening in Minnesota. Um, there's a whole te a soccer team in Minnesota that was completely crowdfunded. The Minnesota Aurora, they had a wow. community based model to get mm -hmm. the team off the ground and people showed up and um, they crowdsource their ownership funding and now the team exists and is thriving. So it really is a pretty interesting trend in women's sports that we just show up for each other. And um, that's how a lot of the biggest results that we've seen have been able to happen. Totally. Yeah. And that's where like, I find that very empowering, you know, for individuals, like you can make a difference. You can do something because we have already and we're seeing it more and more. So um, cool. Okay. How do we follow goals sports? How do we listen to your podcast? So yes, I'll do my shameless plugs here. So <laughs> if you want to follow us on the social medias, we're at goals underscore sports underscore on Instagram, on threads, on Twitter, and then on LinkedIn, you can just search goals, women's sports, and we'll pop right up as far as our podcast. So it's called the business case for women's sports, which is presented by ally. As I mentioned, we are available everywhere. Podcasts are available, probably all the same places you listen to feisty media podcast offerings. So definitely check us out. We love to feature interviews with leaders in women's sports that are doing great work to move the needle and um, generate more business and do some interesting things in front offices across the industry. So that's a little bit more about how you can follow us. Goals-sports.com is our website, and we are looking forward to connecting with you. Fantastic. Well, Caroline, thank you so much again for all of the work that you do. And I'm so excited to be part of a great future for women's sports with you. It is an honor to do this work alongside you. Please keep up all the amazing work that you're doing as well. We are truly doing this together. It's really special. <laughs>
all of our brands and podcasts over the years. I recommend starting with AminoCo Perform, and you can grab some at aminoco.com forward slash performance. If you enter the code performance, you will save 30% and receive a free gift if it is your first purchase. Give it a try and let me know how it goes. That's aminoco.com forward slash performance and use the code performance to save 30%. As a lifelong runner and triathlete turned CrossFitter, I am stoked to announce that the athletic eyewear brand Tafosi Optics has joined us as a partner here at Feisty Media. Tafosi sports glasses hit all the marks for athletes. They're shatterproof poly bicarbonate, so the lenses not only reduce glare, but also offer scratch resistance, which I 100% need. They stay in place when you are moving. The hydrophilic rubber nose pads actually get more grippy the more you sweat. So they are secure and don't slide down your face even when you're running in hot conditions. No matter what sport you do, Tafosi has shades for you. Whether you love tennis, fishing, pickleball, running, cycling, or just hanging out on the beach. They are super reasonably priced, which I love, so I can have multiple pairs that go with any outfit. And of course, feisty listeners get a special discount. So head on over to tofosioptics.com and use the code FM20, FM as in feisty media, to get 20% off your order. That's FM20 at tofosioptics.com. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you.